Welcome to Break Through the Ordinary Podcast. Are you committed to your future self? If you are, sibling duo Mark and Claudine Schermonte will take you on a journey of self-discovery to unlock your highest potential. Through impactful conversations with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, coaches, and healers, we will share practical tips and tools to generate the life you envision. New episodes drop every Monday. Uh, happy to uh, introduce Meryl McKinney. She blends together her somatic and linguistic expertise to create a coaching experience that is insightful, revealing, and compassionate. Throughout her career, whether it is as a dietitian, business consultant, or coach, her deepest desire is that people align to and live the life they envision for themselves. Merrill has spent 25 years employed by Dr. Fernando Flores. During those years, you were on teams responsible for the process and redesign of imp- implementation. She has coached numerous individuals and teams and executives in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, You also have a second degree black belt in Aikido, which I find is amazing. And you continue to practice self-cultivation and a beginner's mind. Uh, Merrill's on the educational staff of Strozzi Institute Somatic Coaching Program and will soon become credentialized by the EMCC as a coach supervisor. All the show notes and everything will show uh, how to get in touch with Meryl. She's a great coach, and uh, we're happy to have you here. Yes. I'm so welcome. Th- so thrilled to have you here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, our pleasure. And I, as you even, even as I hear your bio, I was like, dietitian? <laughs> uh, and, I, you know, corporate. So maybe you could share with us your journey that has brought you here, right, as, a, a, you know, a black belt, as a coach, a somatic coach, maybe you mind sharing some of that with our listeners? Mm-hmm. I, um, it, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that from very, very early on is that I really cared about um, education and making a difference. So, you know, 50 years ago, 55 years ago, they didn't talk so much about making a difference. But um, my whole purpose of being becoming a dietitian was to support people in um, in uh, being able to have healthy lives. So I um, did a lot of educational work in school lunch programs and um, the education of patients one on one. So I really enjoyed that. And um, I moved into management about halfway through. I was a dietitian for 10 years. I moved into management and was struggling. And, um, and that's when I met Dr. Fernando Flores and did a course on management. And I saw that what he was offering was exactly what I needed. Like, oh, so wonder I had all these messes around me. I was the one making them by being unclear <laughs> about, about what, what I wanted and not letting people who worked underneath, underneath me really do their jobs. I was always in the middle of everything trying to fix this and fix that. So, um, I did a number of courses with him and then he offered me a job um, and I worked for him for 25 years. It was a tremendous experience. I um, grew and grew and learned and learned and learned. And um, the methodology made a lot of sense to me that he had about requests and promises and coordination of action. All that made a lot of sense to me. But in the mm. mid nineties, I was being asked to take bigger roles in the company because technically I was, I was good. But I just didn't have the chops, you know, I just didn't have the self-confidence and um, I get nervous and afraid I'd make mistakes. And um, that's when I went to Strozzi Institute. And that was in 1995 because I knew Richard Strozzi Heckler from um, my work at uh, at Fernando's company. He Richard was brought in and did a little bit of work with us and also work with the people that Fernando worked with. So I knew who he was. And someone said, well, maybe you should go do a course with this guy, Richard. You know, it looks pretty interesting. And I had experienced in just a two or three hour workshops that he would do with the staff that if I paid attention to my body, something changed for me. I was calmer. I was more confident. I was less concerned about what other people thought. So that launched me on a 10 year journey with him. And I kept working and studying. And at that time, You just kept going along and doing these courses. And all of a sudden, you could become a somatic coach. So it's a long journey. I think in 2000, 
one, I got certified because I'd been at that time, I'd been five to six years of really consistently practicing and studying with him. Um, and then I turned away from it for a while and didn't do any somatic coaching. And in the last five or six years, it's come back to it. Um, I'm almost 70 years old. It was, um, I think I was missing that really intimate one-on-one -on -one connection with people. And that's really what I enjoy the most is um, getting to know people and assisting them to see where is it that they want to go now? What's in the way? And not like I have to get them there. My job is just to make the space for them to discover what's already in their body wisdom. Um, I, I um, ended up moving or being directed into do, doing work with sexual trauma and uh, people, the victims of sexual trauma and um, hearing their longing for wanting to come back to a body that they used to have before the abuse happened. And it takes um, a tremendous amount of patience and love to do that work. And I am never, ever not in awe of the courage that my clients have, that they're willing to go there and say, you know, I don't want this to be sitting at the head of the table anymore. So that's Beautiful. the work I do now. I, and, um, and other things, you know, everyone has a little bit of something, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> so, yes. So you started to get into about somatic coaching. So can you tell us what exactly somatic coaching is and how is that distinguished from regular coaching? All right. Well, if we look at like, what is somatics? People, that word's used all the time. One of the definitions we use in, um, it was is with Thomas Hanna is that it's the living organism in its wholeness. So then if we move into somatics and say somatics is a holistic methodology for embodying change and it works through the body and, and through the body or body mind, the psychobiology, because in somatics, it's it's one body, mind, spirit. It's like one word. So it's not, oh, I have a mind and I have a body. It's that it is one entity, so to speak. So somatics works through this body, mind, and it um, helps transform uh, conscious choices that we make. Or let me, a better way to say this, it allows us to be able to reflect on certain automatic patterns or automaticity that we have and be able to make a different choice. And what we say is with somatics is when, uh, to be able to act differently under the same old pressures. So I may still have a lot of uh, requirements, a lot of work on my plate, all this stuff, but instead of getting overwhelmed, being concerned about, oh my God, how am I gonna get all this work done? I'm able to take, to organize myself to say, you know what? I've scheduled it out. I have plenty of time. I don't have to go to that old place of being um, afraid that I won't be able to get it all done or I won't do it right. I can back away from that and go, oh, no, I, I, I can do this. I have the space now. Hmm. So my body's different that... and my thoughts are different. Yeah. And what does that look like in work with clients? Like as Mark had asked, like, is this different than, because, you know, we, we talk to coaches, I'm a coach also. What, what is that? What's the, the distinction of coaching somatic coaching in this, in, in this way that you defined it just now? Mm -hmm. So in, in coaching, general coaching, if we, if we go with the International Coaching Federation model, the client has um, something that they want to focus on or change and some kind of result and that we can talk about it. And somatic coaching can be talk based. It doesn't always have to be hands on body work, though there is a component of hands on body work for somatic coaching. But in watching clients, um, sometimes we'll see that they're leaned forward or their eyes are big or they'll be in a slump kind of position. All of that embodiment of these shapes hold 
emotions, they hold stories, and they predispose and direct the, the, the client in this case it, to act in certain ways. And these ways may be beneficial to them or not beneficial. So someone who's timid is, is being asked to take on a higher uh, role with more responsibility and to speak up in a meeting. But in this shape, that's just not possible for them. So in somatic coaching, we begin to teach the um, client to have an awareness of the shape. What's the sensation of it? How can they feel what this is like? What's the story that's in this shape? What's the emotion that's there? So all of that, the sensation, the story, the emotion, all of those are combined together. And we can unwind that where the client will, will say, oh, God, I, I just caught myself wanting to go, oh, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. No, it's not. I'm just talking with my colleague. I can come back into my body. Yes, I might feel a little nervous or uncomfortable, but it doesn't have to take me over. I can let that energy be in my body. I can let it run and not be afraid of it. In somatics, we teach people to turn into the sensations that they otherwise might not want to. And therein lies a fair amount of wisdom that's in the body. So, so it almost sounds like you're walking through a fear threshold or something, like you're moving through. So I'm thinking of body, I'm just thinking of past therapist a long time ago i didn't realize they were doing some somatic but just a touch on the shoulder i remember how terrifying it was because i was working through traumas and stuff so could you tell us i thought of boundaries and and how you work because you said touch people that's very different than normal coaching so if mm -hmm. you can maybe go into more depth on that and how you do that because people come to therapy if they have trauma like that being touched or very delicate places. So I'm really curious how you, how you move into that or how do you do that? Or what does it look like? I mean, you know, what kind of touch are we talking about? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the one word answer is carefully and compassionately. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it takes time to build trust. And, um, I have had clients who have come who are not ready because they need to be willing to move into this place that's frightening and terrifying and uncomfortable. And sometimes people aren't ready to do that or they, or they don't want to do that. And there's other ones that do. So, um, it's, so it doesn't happen r r quickly. You know, I'm, I, I'm mm -hmm. able to, to build, build trust and make a big space for people and, and do a lot of uh, validation of whatever. So, yeah, you've, you've come by this honestly. You know, they're not crazy. This is, you're, you're right. This is, you, you, sh you, you, you should feel this way. You have been violated. You came into your sexuality not on your own terms. So first thing is to right size and make whatever's happening okay. Because a lot of times people don't want to go to that place. So that's part of what happens. Um, somatic body work. So um, a gentleman named Wilhelm Reich, W-E-I-G-H, was a student of Freud. And what he noticed is that talking therapy could take people only to a certain place and that it had a limitation. So he, for whatever observer he was, saw that people armor or they hold tension and stories in certain parts of their bodies. The eyes are one, the mouth, the throat, the chest, the belly area, thighs, knees, and feet that these are typical places of holding or contraction. So if we think of someone, and this would make sense in the time of Freud, that someone who said, oh, I have all this anxiety and I can't do this and I can't do that, oh, stuff, 
even doing that now, I think, oh my God, what am I, how am I going to get all my work done? Over all of this tightens up for me. My belly and diaphragm area it pushes my, um, it um, sort of shrinks my lungs. So I can't breathe fully. So you can imagine like living like this for years and years, someone would have what could be coined as hysteria or panic attacks or anxiety. Well, in somatic body work, we can begin to release that holding so that this, this diaphragm can drop down. There's more space for the breath to come in and out in a, in a way that breathing should happen which is on the inhale, the belly expands first. Sometimes you'll see people that all oh, their breath is way, way up here <laughs> like that. That's an exaggeration. So by releasing these armoring bands, the emotionality changes and the story changes. So I'm not, oh my God, how am I going to get done? And oh, I'm so anxious. Oh my God, oh my God. So I have a story. I have this, oh, and this tightness in my belly center, my diaphragm area. Even my throat's a little constricted. All of that releasing then changes my story, my emotion, and how I am in my in my body or in my soma. So that's the psychobiology of it, the connection. Great. Hey, can we go a little further with that? Like, like, because I, I love the topic you brought up, anxiety. Right, we're we're in the midst <laughs> of this energy larger than ourselves, and <laughs> right now. So if a client is experiencing that, how would you work with them? Like if, literally like, okay, the constriction, the lungs, the story that is right in, in, in this, our body's holding, how would, you know, yes, in coaching, you're holding the space, but how do we, do you work with them to start to do that release? Do you literally do the breath or some form of way of coaching them through this release? If you could share that a little bit with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on the table, on the bodywork table, and, and as a somatic bodywork, I'm always watching, always paying attention. What's too much? What's enough? And for some people, just laying flat on the table is, is, um, creates enough energy of, um, of fear usually is what it is. They're very exposed, you know, on your back, on our backs that way. So just let the breath happen. I might do a little bit of re releasing or hey, it's okay if I put my hand on your chest or always permission, always permission. And so what's happening now for you? What are you noticing? And you know what? There's a lot of, we don't learn this vocabulary in school. So sometimes we have, I say, so is, is it feeling tight there? Is it warm? Like words that describe the sensation. Is it, you have some tingling going on. So teaching people to be able to be aware of the sensations that are in our, their bodies. Um, wow. Yeah. So what you know? What's what else is going on? You know, and just see what the client brings because this is their body that never lies. You know, showing showing what's what's. Um, been in the background for a while okay. so that's on the table you know over over zoom it's a little different but i have yeah, people I wondered about that yeah i i do have people do breathing patterns and you know breath patterns um i incorporate a little bit of feldenkrais stuff you know imagine that your your breath is coming way up into the top of your lungs they go way up underneath these clavicles so let's Bring that breath way up and hold it, hold it, hold it, and big exhale. Do that a couple of times. Okay, what are you feeling now? What are you noticing? Oh, well, you know, now that you say that, I notice I can feel a little release in my belly. Good. So how is that going to support what we're working on today? Or So tying that together. Um, sometimes I have people become my hands. I say, okay, so you're, 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 you're gonna, your hands are going to be my, my hands. You know, you're going to be your hands. So I'm going to have you put your, put your hand on your chest and feel into there. You know, and I have a way to help them get energy in their hands. Describe that. So 
what's it feel like for you for when I have my hand on your chest, even though it's their own hand? So there's um, there's a limitation to Zoom, <laughs> but it's better than yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think of what you said earlier, right? Somatics is mind, body, uh, spirit. It's all one word. It, it it sounds integrating, and and the word that keeps coming to me is presence, right? Like, so what's here for you now? It's it's that integration is through some presence of, of the wisdom, of the mm -hmm. sensations. Yeah, the sensations are the are the gateway in, are the gateway in. Because yeah. like a lot of times under pressure, we'll shape ourselves not to feel the fear or the anxiety or the threat. I mean, it starts as children, and and you can see as, as in watching bodies, you can see sometimes people have their shoulders up. You know, over years of of doing that, and even if you take the posture of that. You can feel that something changes in the breath. The eye, the eyes might get a little bit like, okay, what the heck's going on here? You know, a little hypervigilance with the eyes will come online. So in somatics, we just keep bringing awareness to that. The sensation is always a story in there. It's taking care of something. What's it taking care of? your safety, your belonging, how you maintain your dignity, good body, good body, smart body. It <laughs> kept you safe. You know, it protected you. And now at 45, some of these patterns are no longer useful. Yeah, or 25, you know. go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious. Somatic coaching has been like a hot topic, a hot word lately. What, what are your thoughts on that? Like, where is it coming from or what, what do you think about it? Because it is, you know, I've heard it a lot lately. Yeah. The word, I, yeah I even if it was being done before and I may have experienced some myself, um, it's a pretty hot topic right now. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? You know, everything has its history. I remember someone telling me the first time I saw a yoga studio in Colorado, I knew that yoga had come <laughs> come into the mainstream. And, um, you know, coaching's come along now. Uh, I mean, I'm glad that people are aware that they have bodies. And, <laughs> um, you know, hello, you have a body and it's probably not what you think it is, <laughs> is... Um, So let me just say what this is on my mind is that back to Rene Descartes a long time ago, that's when the body and the mind were separated. Science took the mind and the church took the body and the soul and the spirit. So in one way, it's beautiful that it's coming back now. The mind and the body that in terms of ecology, our connection with community, our connection to spirit and the landscape, all of that's in our bodies. And we've kept them in the Cartesian mind separate. Oh, there's there's nature and then there's science. But we can see the cost, the cost of that. And so I'm very happy that that's coming full circle in a certain way or beginning to come there. The caveat there is that when we begin to work with people's bodies, we need as practitioners to have walked our own desert. And I see it a lot with somatic coaches in the program that I um, teach in. Somebody told me yesterday, I had about earlier this week, I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I just thought I'd come here and learn all about somatics and I could coach people with trauma because I like them. But I had no idea I'd have to do my own work too. And my caveat, my recommendation, if you're going to find a somatic coach, you please interview them. Tell me about your work. How have you dealt with your own trauma? How have you dealt with this? And if they can't answer those questions, they're probably not embodied enough to be able to um, shepherd someone through their transformation. Hmm. Uh, that's a, that, that walk through your own desert. Uh, I've not heard that, but it, it landed for me, right? Like I, I tend mm -hmm. to call it the dark night of the soul, but it is a desert. It, it, it's got some length to it sometimes. <laughs> um, most definitely. Um, 
Yeah, and I appreciate the conversation of the reintegration, the coming home, right? Mm-hmm. Our, our, the Holy Trinity, in that sense, the embodiment of it all, right? We're not separate. Yeah, we're not separate from the plants and the animals. No. We're really not. No, we, we sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we act or make policy <laughs> based on yeah. that, but that's yes. not accurate. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, again, there, there, I, are different cho- there are different choices with different consequences. Yeah. And, and yeah. do we want to keep separate and the consequence that it's giving us now? Mm-hmm. Can you tell us what's the connection or is there a connection between martial arts and somatic coaching? Like I, you know, I know that you black belt and your second belt, black belt is, mm-hmm. is there a in t- in intentionality there? Well, the tradition or the school is Josie Institute uh, where I did my somatic coach training has um, three different discourses that were pulled together to make this discourse of embodied transformation. That's Josie Institute. Um, teaches. And it, one of them is martial arts, because Richard Strozzi Heckler, as the founder of Strozzi Institute, was a longtime martial artist. It still is. He's 77 now. He, he also had a long meditative practice. And he had worked with Randolph Stone and Ida Rolf and other um, body workers and brought those three disciplines together to create this discourse. So in, in training somatics, there was elements of a martial arts in there, like how to have an embodied presence, um, what it is to be centered, which is every, what we practice in, the key, in Aikido, is being centered, which is open, connected, present, and moving with purpose. So um, I started practicing Aikido about 14 years ago when I moved up to Petaluma, which is where Strozzi Institute is, um, because I remember saying, well, I have no excuse not to practice it now. And it's, and it's enabled me to keep practicing moment to moment. Here I'm in front of an opponent. And Aikido is a partner practice. And it's the par- practice of taking the energy of the opponent or the incoming attack and bringing it to a peaceful resolution. It has its roots in jujitsu, where you might have put an elbow to someone's jaw, but in Aikido, no, we're going to take them and and move them on, usually into a roll or something like that. So it's, um, as we like to say, you're coming at me with um, evil intention, like a showman strike or a grab, and I'm going to make sure that you don't spend eons paying off your bad karma. (laughs) I'm going to make sure it comes to a nice, peaceful conclusion for us both. So what what um, Aikido does, and is it, it's a place for me to keep cultivating and practicing. What am I being present to with my partner? Am I connected to them? Am I thinking about the technique? Am I worried here or there? So it's a beautiful practice for coming back to the present moment and being connected. Because I could be in my present moment, but without any connection to anybody. And that's what we all want. I mean, we all want to be connected. We want to be seen and felt, and we want to see and feel others. So that practice really supports building that capability. And to practice with a community of people with that shared intention and mission, they're, they're, it's a, it's a, it's like, oh, I don't think I want to go to a keto tonight. I'm tired. No, but I won't see my friends and we won't get to do this thing that we love to do together so much. So it's a, a community of practice, too. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, it sounds great. Mm. I, I went once or twice and I never followed through. Now I wish I did. I'm listening <laughs> to this. I'm like, oh, I wish I followed through. Oh, I'm mm. never too old. You're never too old to start a keto. <laughs> no, you're... No, I, no, like, no. I'm, like I said, I'm 69 I, years old. I just got my black, my second degree black belt three or four months ago. So wow. anything's possible, I'm Mark. Impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, so we're talking about being in your body, being present. Do you have any tips um, or practices that you could share with our listeners that they can incorporate now, right now, like, you know, some things they could do to really, you know, bring them into their body or. 
be present connection. Number one, know that you have a body and that it is speaking all the time, attempting to get your attention. So um, meditation is a practice and even just sitting quietly for a few minutes in nature and noticing what, what sensations, sensations like again, warmth, cold, pressure, um, stream, it, it, tingling, streaming. Um, that's one way. Another way for is what brings our energy down. Like Claudine, you talked about anxiety. I mean, we're in a collective state of anxiety now as, as a world. Um, dealing with COVID, it's really taken a, a, a toll from overt to very subtle on, on everybody. So everyone's feeling that, whether they're aware of it or not, this is collective anxiety. And coming into a feet, paying attention to one's feet when they're walking on, on the ground is a way to just drop that energy down. Um, and I think the really mark is taking a taking a moment or two just to be quiet and with yourself. Because we're oh I have to go here I have to do this I have to do this oh my god I have to do this because there's so much that's interesting and appealing and compelling. So being able to say you know I really I can't do ten things today I can do six, and I'm going to take some time to just sit and relax and be with myself and see what I'm thinking, see what I'm feeling, and know that it's okay, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. I hear one of the tips then is also permission to create that space yeah. for ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Let go of the phone. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, you mentioned something I, I want to go back to way in the beginning of our interview, which was... What you learned for Fernando was right the, this concept of uh, agreements and promises and requests, and mm-hmm. you know I I do know Merle. I, I I was wondering if you could share you know some of that with our listeners because particularly I, I think we think we have agreements when I go so right that's all right right. I, I, I yeah. keep walking, and I go. Yeah, he he said yes. Ah, he he nodded <laughs> his head a little, and right. And I, you know, I think there's a clarity around agreements that our listeners and everyone could benefit from, if we understand some of the components, and who's 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 the parties of an agreement. Would you be open to sharing some of that mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. way that you studied? Yeah, be happy to. Um, these two gentlemen named Austin and Cyril's invented this thing called speech act theory. And one was at UC Berkeley and the other one was at Oxford. And what they said is that every language is only composed of certain component parts. So people make, no matter the language, they make requests of each other. They promise to each other. They declare certain futures for themselves. They judge, they judge, make assessments, opinions. And there's also facts, like I'm wearing black today and we're, that's a fact and the temperature outside now and that I live in California. Um, and that's it. That's it. That's all, every, no matter the, what the language spoken, those are the five elements that are present. Underneath one of those, like a request, there, also, there needs to be five little sub, sub distinctions, we'll say which is that there is a speaker and a hearer. And what you just demonstrate is, oh, you're saying, oh yeah, sure, oh yeah, yeah. But is, are two people together face to face? Yes, I can tell that when you say yes, you really are saying yes to what I'm asking, not yeah, just to get rid of me. So the speaker and hearer, there's usually in a, in a request, there's um, can you do X? By a certain time, time a lot of times is is um, mis- isn't included. Can you can you okay, can you meet me sometime for a movie? Mm, that's not a request. Hi, would you like to go see Lord of the Rings at six o'clock tonight? That's a request. 
the conditions are clear, the time's clear, we're assuming the person's available. So those are elements that need to be present in a request and that the promiser on the other side is promising to that. It's a contract. And then there's all sorts of things about, you know, sometimes you can't do as you promised and how you renegotiate or cancel or revoke, all for the sake of keeping the relationship intact. When people aren't clear in requesting and promising, they find themselves in situations as opposed to putting themselves in situations. So finding yourself like, how in the world did this happen? How come this project's all so crazy? And if we were to analyze, it's like, well, I didn't know you needed it on Thursday. So Mm -hmm. that's how the messes get made and the frustration happens. Yeah. So uh, all those years of- Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and in process redesign and stuff, uh, organizations and network of commitments. So in all that consulting, we looked at what's the network of commitments between people or departments, and is it clear what the conditions of satisfaction are and what's the by when? If, I, if I'm not getting from customer service what I need in production to do my job, then there's back and forth and back and forth and waste. But if customer service gives me exactly what I need for my conditions of satisfaction, then it's like I can go on and do what I need to do. And pass it forward to shipping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I think that relates to family functioning, uh, right? Like even in relationships, yeah. if yeah. I don't give you what you need, even as my brother, <laughs> right? Then he can't anyway. move forward with it, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I, I appreciate that. It, it, you know, it, it is about that clarity and the agreement. Um, yes. In every, rela- I'm, I'm thinking about it on every level, yeah. every, rela- like, we talk about communication and clarity and we don't have as much communication clarity that we think we have, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. which would really change a lot of relationships. Yeah. For I, sure. I mean, I, I often find that it's under, under most conflicts is there wasn't an agreement that both parties, like you said, there was a, there's a requester and there's a listener, like right. Mm-hmm. They were, that they each participated to terms of, you know, agreement. I'll just use your your language. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And I want to bring it back into semantics too. Yeah. It, because then you find people like, Oh, well, I, I don't know. I'm kind of afraid to ask. And you can see there's a shape of that. Well, I don't want to hurt their feelings or I don't want to ask for what I want. So in semantics is a whole way to unravel that where people really can begin to ask and design their lives, not be hesitant and afraid and settle for something at the end of the day when you're not satisfied. Mm. So it's it's even the internal communication and clarity. That's what I'm I'm starting to hear. Mm -hmm. Like in that somatic, you're actually getting clear and having communication with yourself that lines up or is authentic or is true to you. Instead of this, what's true is I would like this. Mm -hmm. So it's moving Mm -hmm. into that for yourself too on an individual space. Oh, I love it. I love this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, you 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 mentioned it about uh, finding a, a somatic coach. Um, uh, for some reason, I would even want to go. I don't know deeper. You know, I, I'm not sure my thoughts here because there's something coming up for me. I think. Um, but where where are they around the country? What kind of schools do they go to? You said ask questions, but like how how would you even go into it? Do you go online and look up somatic coaches? Do you um, how do you even know that you're even getting somebody that's before you even get into d- deeper questions? That's even is there certain schools that have reputations or that's what I would like to know. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not well schooled there, so to speak. I mean, I know about the Strozzi Institute, okay. you know, and I know that they have a, a list of associates on their website of people that are trained by them. Um, but I'm not real familiar with other somatic coaching okay. schools. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. I yeah. just, I, I wanted yeah. to ask that because I just, uh, I was very curious about that. Hmm. I mean, yeah, word of mouth, I think is. There are that you I was just going to say, you know, word of mouth, you know, if, if, you know, that's, I mean, I, a lot of my 
clients come that way for me, just referrals. Um, so, but somebody else might be able to answer that better, Mark, than me. Okay. I'm sure. They do. Well, let me piggyback just one thing on that. Is it always trauma that people are coming to work with somatic uh, coaches? Not necessarily. Is it usually? No. Okay, Not so. necessarily. You know, people as they um, get higher in organizations need to be able to um, have a wider look at an organization, be able to see more systemically. So in their body, then they need more width. So sometimes people who are engineers or scientists or some have have been focused in seeing at a at a at a more detailed smaller level now they become executive so they're looking needs to change so that's a, a way where we, they need to get more width and just be able to see even their vision opens up and and to see from a different body honestly um let me think what right, else thank you yeah but at the end of the day, we all have places where we hold and and when that's released, we can relax and engage and connect at a deeper, more intimate level. Before we transition, I, I wanted to ask if there was other um, wisdoms of the body or of you that you'd like to share with our listeners. In this space of we all do want to connect Yeah, it is trust that you do want to connect and be curious about what's stopping that. Don't judge, get curious. Wow, what happens when I, I really wanted to say to my um, son or my daughter or spouse, friend, I really wanted to say, God, you know, I I love you. I love you. Right. Thanks so much. You know, you know, to be what stops you from saying that and get curious about that. And the other thought side is what stops you from receiving that. There's a lot of goodness in the world and sometimes we can't see that or, or feel and receive it. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're in this world right now where there's disconnection, there's sides and, you know, where does so somatic coaching and like social justice and all that interplay with each other? Cause we're in a very, uh, it's hard to even describe uh, cause most of us don't really know what's happening. Um, so how, how do they interplay? I can give you about a uh, half an inch worth of depth on this. <laughs> um, we we're shaped not only by our families and the schools we go to, we're also shaped by lots of cultural norms and lots of, of uh, assumptions and beliefs and they shape us. So one of the things that social justice now is do, it, doing is pushing against that a little bit, pushing, pushing back. But we're all part of that soup. We live, in, we live in communities and we live in social spaces. And we're product of our social spaces. So um, one of the things in, in somatics that um, I've been taking a course in somatics and, and these sites of shape and power is what happens to me when I'm around maybe a certain um, race or gender or this or that, what happens in my body that's automatic that isn't my choice. It came to me and it's been appropriated by me in the narratives of the time that I grew up, the society, the middle class, whatever class that I grew up in, 
the geographical location, all of that has shaped my the way that I see the world. So questioning those assumptions, somatic, that's how we use somatics to do that. And I know that there are lots and lots of people who in somatics who that's their area, the politics of of trauma and social justice and how to become a, a fight for, not a fight against. Mm-hmm. And the way we have to do that, I, I think, is really look deeply into our own embodied prejudice that um, are, again, part of the shaping that we are in the society and the communities we grew up in. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, wow. Well. Well, <clears throat> such an I, interplay. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, you know, th- this this is the time when we also ask our listeners to, you know, it's a call to action. It's a challenge for them to embody our conversation today. We really like to create that together, and uh, they can, you know, show show us what they do in social. Uh, I mean, uh, in social media. Is there a suggestion, uh, you know, of, of something you would suggest that our listeners do to? Embody this conversation of somatics? Well, what I said earlier is just take the time, just to, even you know five minutes, just to, to be with yourself and enjoy yourself and discover yourself. Um, okay. And the space to feel nature, if you're out in nature, to feel its aliveness and let it inform you. And, and, mm-hmm. um, our resilience comes from nature or animals. Sometimes it's art for people, but uh, um, put you put yourself in places where you can feel that aliveness and that freedom. You know, I have a dog now because animals are my resilience, and she's made all the difference in my life in terms of finding, you know, it, cultivating and re- bringing back joy alive again. And again, for some people, it's in nature. nature. So um, find those places that inspire, have you feel free, hope, renewal, and have that as a practice too. That's, that's one thing. And um, second of all is feel your feet on the ground. <laughs> feel the ground, feel okay. gravity, yeah. <laughs> Right. So feeling gravity mm-hmm. or f- finding a practice, be allowing yourself to be five so, minutes in curiosity with yourself, yeah. you know, be in touch it is a source of joy and resilience. And when you do that, please tag us on social media at, you know, the Breakthrough the Ordinary podcast. And we're on, on Facebook. So I appreciate that one. Um, uh, the, and so we're going to go into a next one. I, I apologize. That is actually tag us at the BTO podcast <laughs> on, on social media, on particularly on so Facebook. So we're going to move into this category, which is we're going to do some quick fire questions. They're really short answers, what comes to mind. And um, so the first one that I'll ask is, what's the definition of love to you? Care. So who who was the person who had the most influence in creating who you are? For better or worse, my dad. And why? (laughs) (laughs) And why is that? (laughs) And also why? (laughs) Uh, Uh, Do you want me to answer that? That why? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. because I was committed to proving him wrong at some place when it was, Oh, why'd you do that stupid thing? Why are you this? Why, you know, yeah, you should just, you know, be happy graduating from high school and stuff. There's a part of me that was like, Oh yeah, you you think so? Watch this. And that fire or whatever that was really has moved, taken me a long, long way. Mm. Mm. Okay. What's your superpowers? Uh, that can be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, really, like in coaching and making an open, reflective space where people can um, take a deeper look 
and um, listen to themselves and go, wow, now that you ask that, this is what I, this is what I think. But this is, you know, now that you ask this, this is what I really think. And just being able to make that space and be patient for that to happen for another person. Yeah. So uh, this is a deeper question. What, what in your life makes you feel vulnerable and how do you handle that? Um, so as you said in the, in the bio, I've been training in coach supervision to be a supervisor, a coach, which I want to say for all the coaches out there, it's not a role of oversight. It is a role of um, making a reflective space to, to, to um, discover more about our beingness. You know, who am I being as a coach or in, in my world? So um, it's a place where many times I need, I need to be able to bring my feelings in, in a way that um, is vulnerable for me to, to feel myself that deeply and to put it out there because that was not a safe thing to do in my home. So to say things like, gosh, I'm feeling afraid right now. Where do you think that might be coming from? When I'm listening to someone that I'm supervising talking about uh, a relationship they might have with a client or somebody, so the, that at that level of vulnerability, um, and how do I work with that? Is just like I just did now. <laughs> Feel it. Take a deep breath and um, uh. know that. There's no danger. Remind myself that I'm safe. That I'm safe. Hmm. So I, I want to thank you for this time. These were our, our fast fire questions, and <laughs> I just want to see if there's anything else you'd like to share with us. Um, and this is such a nice deep dive. So I want to thank you for what I've learned today. Oh and yeah. This, yeah. Um, yeah. And this opening up the space even to talk about somatic coaching and what you bring to it. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's um, always, a pl- I mean, I just could talk, we could do this for hours. It's a wonderful, something I'm very committed to. I enjoy it. It's fascinating. And uh, I think my last thing I want to say is, okay, come on, Mark. I want to see you on that mat. On the Aikido mat. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I thought I was getting on the table. Uh, both. I, thank you. I, I, you've been challenged, bro. <laughs> I've been challenged. Yes, I have. And, you know, it's funny. I have a, a friend who's a 10th degree Aikido, and I, I went to his dojo and stuff, and I just never took to it. Like, I wanted to, and I just didn't commit to it. And I went to another dojo close by. to, um, But I like the challenge. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And I've been thinking about it too. What what a pleasure! And yeah, yeah and I have to tell you, our listeners, you might want to watch this one and not just listen because you also offered the movements of your own body and shape to help illustrate. So this is one of those podcasts you might want to get and look at us on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. And and she's beautiful too. So it's a beautiful woman too. <laughs> Thank so, you, Mark. Thank yes. you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to our next connection. And we're just yeah. going to wrap up with our little song and our out, <laughs> uh, out go. And, but it's been a pleasure. So been a pleasure. Thank you very yes, much. Same for me. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, thanks for listening to Break Through the Ordinary Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and our deep dive into somatic coaching and the tools and wisdom that live in your body. If you'd like to support the podcast, please leave a rating and share it with others and post it on our social media. To catch the latest, you can follow the BTO podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And thanks again, and we'll see you next time.